All right, well, welcome. We're going to get started here for discussion of what's going on for liberty in Asia. I'm going to, in a couple of minutes, ask for two questions from the audience, so think about them. What did you come here to learn? So if there's some issue, formulate your question. I don't want to surprise you, and I'll call on it. I think it's nice to get audience feedback uh, in terms of the involvement. We have three wonderful, hardworking advocates of liberty. And when I was thinking about it this morning, something occurred to me that I hadn't thought about earlier. Uh, my colleagues were the ones who organized the panel. I've been on the road to 11 countries in the last month. But it turned out I was present at the foundation of all three of these think tanks. And it makes me feel like a very proud dad to see how they have grown up and how active they have been. So uh, I'd like to start then with Ira Azari from the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs in Malaysia. She is in charge of research projects. She's a dynamo for liberty in Malaysia. Well, I met the Wan Saiful Wan Jan, the founder, originally it was called Malaysia Think Tank, uh, at Cambridge University 2007 or six, I think, and started this discussion, and they founded the think tank, and with other colleagues like Abedin Mukriz, uh, really have gone on to enormous success. Next to her is Dhananath Fernando. Uh, Sri Lanka has been through so much difficulty over the past uh, 50 years or so, and our friends there were working hard, but under quite difficult situation with the war ongoing and authoritarian movements in the country. And I think it was 2015, there was a surprise opening, a uh, political shock, and I got on a plane and uh, flew to Colombo and met with our colleagues, and the result was Advocata, and a very young man uh, stepped up and said, I'm willing to be the point person with this, and Advocata has had so much success. And then, with our colleague Khalid Ramizi, who's uh, joining us uh, via Zoom, uh, I was in Afghanistan, I don't, it all becomes a blur after a while, I think 2009, and uh, met with a group of professors and journalists who are committed to liberal ideas, and there was a very young man there present at that meeting, and Khalid has stepped up and has become such a leader with Afghanistan Economic and Legal Studies Organization. So I, I feel a bit like a, a dad uh, to these organizations and a very, very proud one indeed. Now, they're also coordinating with a new center that we've launched. You've heard my colleagues talk about our center strategy. We want more peer-to-peer -peer interaction not top down from the top of the pyramid down. We know why that doesn't work, because the people at the top of the pyramid don't know the problems that the rest of the people in the pyramid are facing. And so we're engaging a lot more peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication among CEOs of think tanks, and if they're big enough, they have a COO, a chief operating officer, among the research directors, again, uh, going across the think tanks, research directors, to research directors, uh, communications, and so on. So this is the way we're going to try to flatten this, make it less hierarchical, more interactive. We've launched the uh, Center for Asia and Oceania. Uh, we want to incorporate a very large geographic region, so that includes everything from Iran to Korea and Mongolia to New Zealand, and that's a lot of countries, a lot of cultures, a lot of civilizational paths and languages uh, that are involved in this. We had our first event November 8. We had 28 research directors of think, tankers, uh, think tanks interacting. Two of them presented their research and then presented the problems that they're facing. And we crowdsourced 
uh, solutions to that for projects in Indonesia and India. And it was, I think, a really helpful experience. We're going to be doing another one in January, and we want to build out, again, this coordination among groups. The other, I'm very happy to be inter integrating our uh, Aussie and Kiwi colleagues more widely into this, and we've had lots of conversations with the New Zealanders who are now forming a public interest law group. Uh, I put them in touch with Institute for Justice and Pacific Legal Foundation in the US, and we're hoping to see that in Australia as well. Now, I'd like to start then by raising an argument that we've heard uh, for years from a wide variety of figures with different political orientations, from Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore uh, to the current CCP leadership, the Chinese Communist Party leadership, uh, have argued liberal democracy, individual rights, the rule of law, market economy, exchange, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are somehow foreign to the region and violate uh, what are sometimes called Asian values. And so I wanted to start out by saying, do you think there's any truth to that claim? Let me start with Ira. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, it's a privilege to be on this panel, uh, especially coming all the way from Malaysia, uh, practically the other end of the planet. Uh, yes, so thank you so much. And your point on Asian values, I think, um, when, when we had a discussion about this panel yesterday uh, and you brought up Asian values, um, I was actually thinking to myself, wow, I haven't heard that term in a while, actually. Um, so maybe I'll just give a 411 on what it actually is. So Asian values was something that was propagated by uh, the former Singapore Premier Lee Kuan Yew and also uh, Mahathir Mohamad, who was Malaysia's Prime Minister, fourth and seventh Prime Minister, um, back in the 80s, 90s, uh, when, you know, the, there was this, Asia was, Southeast Asia particularly was going through an economic boom. And basically, what, what it means is that, so they're saying that Asians value community over the individual, harmony over individual, you know, civil liberties, and, uh, and you know, and which means that universal human rights, universal values don't really apply um, to Asia. And, uh, you know, Mahathir still uh, believes in this quite strongly, I think, even until today. So, you know, let's, let's see whether, whether that, that's true or not. I mean, look, do, do Malaysians value family and community? Well, of course we do, like a lot of other societies in this world, right? Um, yeah, of course we have, you know, when, when we have weddings, um, 2,000 people is normal, you know? So we are, we love family, community, uh, but does that mean that we do also don't value individual liberty and human rights? I don't think that's true. Because um, Malay, you know, the Malay archipelago has a long history of upholding uh, liberty, human rights, and also free trade. Uh, historically, Malaysia has always been a crossroads of trade um, in, in the region. Um, and my second point is that we need to be very careful when you know, these kinds of ideas are being uh, propagated by authoritarian leaders because, you know, it, it, it usually means that they're trying to impose a their own values onto society. And indeed, if you look at the history of um, Malaysia and Singapore, you know, civil liberties hasn't been, um, you know, it hasn't been great. So uh, my feeling is that things like Asian values have been used as a sort of a veneer to actually constrain civil liberties, free, free speech and freedom of expression. Um, and, you know, it's basically being used by leaders to say, look, this is not how we do things in Malaysia. Uh, free speech is a Western thing. Uh, and that has been used over and over again, uh, which I think is, is quite problematic. Yeah. I think we could add to that. There's another way of looking at it. Simon Lee is working on this right now in the Chinese context. Uh, instead of starting from the individual as if the individual is some isolated atom, and we all know that's not true. We're, we're all born into families and communities and civilizations and social orders. He said, we also need to present a liberalism of emergent order as opposed to violence. The other authoritarians say, we believe in order and order comes with a hammer. 
and we hit you when you don't do what we want. But we understand and it's deeply rooted in a great deal of Asian civilization, the idea of a harmonious society comes from the bottom up through the virtue of the individual person. And think about Confucianism, the Mencius, think about Taoism and the works of Lao Tzu and many others so that there's an alternative formulation of the same idea but coming at it from the harmonious society rather than the society with a hammer, which is what Xi Jinping is offering us. Let me ask, Dhananath, Sri Lanka is a, is a complex society. It's not how a lot of people see it as somehow monolithic. It's very complex, has many internal uh, divisions and, and complexity. Tell us about how uh, liberal values and principles are received there. Mr. Tom, uh, thank you very much. It's honored and privileged to be here. Uh, so Sri Lanka, when we look at it, it's complicated because we have been interacting, trading with each other for a long period of time. We have about a history which goes back to about 2,500 years. But what, is, what we always see is it has been benefited a lot from trade uh, for a longer period of time. So how I see it as Asian values, rather than seeing it as Asian values, I think there are universal principles which we all respect respecting with each other, human dignity, helping them, someone to grow and improving quality of life, overcoming poverty. Those are, those are universal values that we all want to live in prosperity. Rather than looking at its Asian or African, those are human values that we all have to uh, all, all respect. And what is, as I, What's, what I strongly believe is what is right is right. When no one is, even no one is following that, but what is wrong is wrong, even though everyone is doing it. So you can bring up like different terms, like Asian values, different people do it for different reasons. But how I see it is the, the, the universal principles acts more, and that's where the liberal uh, and individual freedom comes in. Because even if someone wants to focus on their family, that's also an individual choice. And you have the freedom to do that. And that is respected. And especially a, a country like Sri Lanka, where even Buddhism, which is one of the main religions, which, is, which has come from India, even Muslims, that has come from the Middle East, Catholics, that has come from another part of the world. So when you have everybody in one single country, of course you have to respect each other, respect everyone's beliefs, trade with each other, work hard for prosperity. So those are, I see as uh, universal human values, and that's very much relevant for all Sri Lankans, all Asians. There could be certain, cer certain values, uh, of course cultural things, maybe food patterns and things like that, but I think overall, liberalism and individual freedom is a universal value. We all are prospering and it may be have an evolutionary process, which even if you go back to 2,500 years back, but I think we all are evolving slowly. But I think in my part of the world, the evolution process is quite slow, but we are working hard to bring it to the forefront. And that's how I see it, Tom. Uh, we're optimistic with you on our team. Uh, I want to turn to Khaled. Uh, because we all watched uh, on television and so on the uh, total collapse of the uh, Afghan Republic, this uh, propped up by taxpayer dollars from foreign countries. It was a kind of an artificial state, centralized, no, f no federalism, and so on. The things that you have been focusing on for years, explaining that you need to have an Afghan government supported by Afghan people, and not by uh, the T Department of Defense or NATO or the European Union, uh, and then also promoting local governance and competition among units. So I'd like to ask you, Khaled, uh, how you see this question of, does the idea of individual rights and uh, responsibility and limited government, does it have roots in Afghan societies? And then, because of what you experienced, could you give us a very short update on what is happening with ELSO, uh, Afghanistan Economic Legal Studies Organization, and the work you're still doing in Afghanistan? Khaled. 
thank you so much, Dr. Palmer. Uh, Elo Hall, it is really an honor for me that today uh, I join with all of you uh, by this uh, technology. And this is also because of the capitalism that enabled us to, uh, to, to, to join with all of you. Otherwise, I wish I was there with all of you physically. But thanks to the capitalism that even at this moment uh, enable us to, to, to join with you and to share uh, my insights and my concerns with all of you. And also thanks to Atlas Network uh, for, for organizing of such a great event every year and for giving me this opportunity to share my idea. Uh, as you all know that I am in exile and the life in exile is totally different than a normal life. Uh, so uh, I will try my best to share my uh, idea, my insights uh, uh, based on the topic of the uh, 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 on the topic of the event as much as I can. But there are a number of tensions. There are a number of things to uh, we are wondering about that, about our life, about our works, and all that puts us somehow in in a different condition. So to answer this question, Dr. Palmer, uh, I would like to request you to just please give me a little more time than the other respected panelists. So I should go uh, a little deep in details and share that what we are doing at the moment and what happened to the country and other important issues. Uh, as you all know, uh, the two biggest achievements of Afghanistan, uh, the first one was the international community supports and engagement with the Afghan society in the last two decades. And the second important thing was the new constitution of, of, of Afghanistan that ensured uh, uh, different than all the past constitutions of Afghanistan, uh, ensured all kinds of freedom, civil, political, and social uh, rights for, for the citizens, uh, and also accepted the uh, free market has the system, uh, economic system of, 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 of the country. But unfortunately, uh, we lost both of them uh, after the 15th of August and after the collapse of the country on the hand of uh, Taliban. Uh, but indeed, we should not forget that the people are there, their wishes are there, and their mission for having of a prosperous and free Afghanistan are is still there and exist. What I want to share today about Afghanistan with all the respected audience and you, uh, uh, and uh, to update you about the uh, current condition of the people, I'm sure that all these are the points which is also happening uh, uh, in China by the uh, Jinping government. Uh, you all know that Afghanistan passed different uh, uh, kinds of regime different kinds of uh, ec uh, economic system and also go governing governance system. We uh, experience uh, communists and uh, uh, we, we pass a lot of tough and extremely bad days. Uh, we uh, experience and we pass a Mujahideen government, which there was no uh, chance, there was no uh, uh, things, not, nothing under the name of uh, freedom or nothing about uh, 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 the economic freedom or something else. And there was no opportunities for the people to, to they should even educate, to they should work or to they should continue their life in a peaceful uh, or in a prosperous situation. And uh, also we experienced mullahs uh, uh, as Taliban was in the country from 1996 until 2001, uh, and none of these systems were successful uh, in Afghanistan. Until 2001, that based on the new constitution that I mentioned before, the constitution paved the way for the uh, economic system of, 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 of the country to be free market, uh, and the economy of the people uh, from zero uh, went to uh, 100%. So the, the, the people uh, again came to the Afghanistan, to, to the country, and they started their own businesses, 
we had a lot of uh, achievements in, in uh, telecommunication, in media sector, in education sector, uh, a lot of factories established in the country. And the people were very, very happy with, with that condition, even before the collapse. We had a lot of challenges, bombing, explosions, and a lot of things, but the people were very happy because of a market-based system and also about the freedom of expression that we had in the country and everything was uh, going on. But what happened? A few corrupted politicians sold the nation, sold the country very cheap. So now let me share the important point in here. Uh, in, in Afghanistan, we also had a number of uh, politicians, a number of academics, a number of other uh, figures uh, uh, who were also against the liberal democracy, against individual rights, against all kinds of uh, freedom. And they were working actively uh, uh, against the ideas that we are promoting at the, at, uh, even at the moment in the country. And now, which Taliban uh, took the control of the country, they totally understand that it is only a free market-based system which people can live uh, in peace uh, and prosperity. Uh, at the moment, the economic condition of, 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 of the country is, is, is in, in a very bad condition. The people are jobless, the people are foodless. Uh, more than 95 percentage of, of, of the population of the country are under the poverty, and even they don't have food for themselves for, for, for two or for three times uh, in 24 hours. So the people, uh, even uh, let me please share this also with, with respected audience and with you, the people uh, to, 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 to share with the audience and with you that how an authoritarian government and how the dictatorship government, they are failing in everything and they are not uh, 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 the government or the system to uh, work based on the uh, opinion, based on the ideas of, of, of the people. The people went to the prime minister of the Taliban a few days ago because of the uh, currency, the local currency of, of the country is losing its cost day by day and also uh, because of the job, the, there is no uh, job opportunity for the people and because of the poverty. And the prime minister of Taliban said to them that uh, this is something that we cannot do anything. Go and pray for the God, to God should give you food. So we are not responsible for that. So what I want to say as the last point, uh, Taliban, they were saying that uh, we defeated Taliban. We won the, the war, but it is really great to share with you and with the respected audience that just today I learned and I, my friends from the country shared, me, shared the news with me that Taliban, that they were writing a few quotes, uh, a few slogans on the streets of Kabul streets, uh, Kabul city, that they defeated the uh, uh, U.S. In, in the country. Uh, defeated their soldiers and defeated their uh, ideologies, which, which was market economy. Now they understand that because of the growing of poverty, that the only system that can handle, that can solve the problem, the, the poverty problem of the country is uh, a free market-based system. And they are now uh, erasing their words, uh, the slogans from uh, from from uh, the series of, 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 of the COVID. So as the last point, uh, I would like to say, even the groups, the regimes like Taliban, that they don't have anything uh, other than killing of innocent people in a country such as Afghanistan, now they totally understand that the key to prosperity, that the key to peace is a uh, is liberal democracy, is individual rights, is a free market-based system which can uh, give opportunity to everyone to they should handle their work and they should share their ideas for the betterment of the uh, society. And in here, I would like to also say about exactly about the work of ELSO that we are doing at the moment in Afghanistan, 
we are very, very much grateful from the great work of our friends like uh, Ms. Linda Wetsun uh, and also a number of other colleagues like Dr. Mustafa Akul that they equipped us with a number of books, for example, the Foundations of a Free Society book, Islamic Foundations of a Free Society book, and also the Islam Without Extremism book, that we translated these books and separated, distributed among the people. Even at the moment, these sources enable us to, we continue our work in the ground and we teach the people, especially the Taliban, that these are these ideas are totally exist in Islam, in our religion, in our culture, and there is no nothing difference, and everything should uh, be going on. So thank you so much, and uh, there are a number of other issues that I would like to mention later. Well, thank you, Khaled, and I think uh, I should make sure everyone knows the extraordinary bravery of our colleagues in Afghanistan, and they are still in the country holding seminars on toleration, on democratic processes. This requires a, a degree of personal courage to do that. And part of the importance is our colleagues, Linda Whetstone and others, uh, making sure that texts are available on liberalism in an Islamic context. And this is, as uh, Khaled said, been extremely helpful to them uh, in continuing their work and also finding the local roots. Part of what we do is localism. And uh, liberalism has roots in every civilization and every culture and uh, in the, uh, Hinduism and Christianity and Judaism and Islam and Buddhism. All religions have this core of the importance of the human being and the individual human. Uh, I'd like to then turn so we can get more of an interactive approach. I have some more questions I'd like to pose, but let me ask someone from the audience if there's something you'd like to hear discussed. So we've got Ray right here. I'm going to take two of them, Ray, and then, so come on. Sure. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure yet, if, my name's Ray, uh, if this is a statement or a question, but I'll tell you, uh, what has occurred, and that's why I'm here today, uh, sometime in the last few months, I got this signal. I don't know if it's the universe talking to me or I just figured it out, I don't know. But the signal is something like, the Chinese Communist Party is living on borrowed time. And I don't know where it came from, I have no predictions to the future, but I thought I would at least say it to the room that that's my body's or my system's sense of it, and maybe it's wishful thinking, I don't know. If you wish to speak to it, please do. Uh, but I, and maybe this is something for someone in the room. Maybe if you had the, the signal or the inkling as well, I am curious. Thank you, so we're gonna, we'll be talking about the CCP and uh, Xi Jinping's regime. Petar, you had uh, right, right here uh, something you'd like to put on the table. So um, I've been wondering about, like, looking at the Asia, and I'm not an expert, but we see the new policies of CCP that we'll have, and they're having geopolitical implications and reshaping the environment and the whole context in which we talk about the ideas of liberty. Um, I often hear about that, but I think that we uh, rarely, I mean generally, India is rarely mentioned as a factor and I think there could be a lot of interesting things happening there should the rise of the CCP continue. And I was wondering whether we could reflect, one, whether how, what would the role of India be, regardless of the bad things happening in India, but there is also I think a lot of good things happening in the society of India, and uh, whether it can be a, a counterbalance of a kind to the, to the ambitions of the CCP. And second, if the authoritarian tendencies in Asia, especially in Southeast, but, but in other places as well, uh, should be countered at the top levels of the free countries, or should we work on more like a lower level, like city or region or with a province or like lower, let's say, federal units and build it like bottom up. So who is the ally, central governments or local and regional governments? So that would be like some of my okay, questions. Okay, so we've got two, two questions, uh, one asked twice. Let, let me, let's talk about the, the, 
uh, CCP Xi Jinping point. And by the way, I'm always careful. I never say China. There are a lot of people in China, many of whom are in prison right now. It's the dictatorship of the Communist Party and Xi Jinping. Same thing with Russia. It's not Russia doing things, it's the Kremlin and Mr. Putin and his uh, cronies. So our friend Simon Lee of Hong Kong raised this issue and what we see our, our friend Jimmy Lai yesterday uh, sentenced to a prison for lighting a candle. Lighting a candle gets you a prison sentence under the new dictatorship. I should add all of our partners in mainland China have been closed by force, including physical force. The welding shut the doors of Uni Rural Institute, one of our oldest uh, partners. So there is a, a something happening uh, that's uh, frightening in China, uh, but also, and I should mention the Uyghur genocide that we're watching just almost helplessly, the entire people being effectively extinguished, uh, language, culture, religion, mosques being uh, demolished. Um, let me turn then to Ira. How do you see the challenge of this newly aggressive dictatorship in Asia? So this question about the CCP um, is an interesting one, I think, because so at Ideas we are also actually carrying out a quite a big regional research project on the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, and from what we found, I think the issue with the BRI is well, firstly, China comes with a lot of capital, right, and countries like Malaysia. Uh, that's greatly in need of infrastructure such as um, public transportation, uh, mainly pub public transportation actually through, through trains, uh, we, we just don't have the kind of capital that is needed to build a, a train track, for example, that goes from the west coast to the east coast of the peninsula. It needs to cut through a mountain range. So, you know, that costs billions in, in ringgit. And China comes with capital. And, uh, you know, the Export-Import Bank of China and, and all that is, is huge. So, what is lacking in, in, in Chinese investments is, firstly, it's transparency and accountability, right? So, there is no rules-based system in which these um, investments come in. It's basically, you know, our Prime Minister and Xi Jinping sitting in a room making a deal. Okay, let's go build this, this, this train track or whatever it is that Malaysia needs. So... Firstly, what, what ideas always always opposes is this the, the just the opaqueness of these um, procurement deals with China. On the point on authoritarianism, uh, I'm a bit I'm I'm actually a bit more cautious to to say that uh, there is um, there is an overt impact from the CCP at least at least not in Malaysia. Um, when I was thinking about this last night, you know, I was I was thinking to myself. Malaysia, the Malaysian government doesn't need external help to, to, to become, you know, di to have dictator tendencies or authoritarian tendencies. You know, we, we have done that ourselves since our um, independence in 1957. Um, so, you know, the, this sort of um, export of uh, authoritarian tendencies, um, I, I, I personally do not see that, and there is no evidence of that, actually. Um, in Malaysia. However, what does exist in Malaysia, it, because so Malaysia has a substantial Chinese population as well, right, that came over in the 19th century. So, um, and there are obviously racial tensions between uh, the, the Malay majority race and the, the Chinese minority. So, what does come up occasionally in our, you know, in the toxicity that is the political discourse is a suspicion that is always brought up by the Malay Muslim government to the Chinese population, which then come, you know, connotations of communism comes in there because historically, the Communist Party in Malaysia, which doesn't exist anymore, um, mainly comprised of Chinese, Chinese people. So, so there is sometimes, you know, when the Malay Muslim right-wing movement in Malaysia wants to sort of bring up this Chinese suspicion, then there will be these kinds of discourse in, in the news about, you know, calling the Chinese population as communists. And, and, and so, so these kinds of um, connotations exist, uh, but our primary 
problem, I think, with, with the BRI is just the, the complete opaqueness and you know, the, the kind of loan and financing structure that I'm sure um, many of you here are familiar with uh, that has no accountability and what are the implications on Malaysian taxpayers. So for me, that is the primary concern for Malaysia, actually, on the CCP. Khaled, let me turn to you on this because I know that uh, there have been meetings uh, with Taliban leaders and the Chinese Communist Party leadership uh, and the great interest the CCP has adopted, puzzlingly enough, 19th century European mercantilism and colonialism as their economic policy. You have to control the resources physically. They don't seem to understand there's commodity markets. You don't have to control the oil wells or control the copper mines to buy oil and copper. But that's the model. And they're deeply interested in Afghanistan and the mining opportunities there. Uh, how do you see the role of uh, the CCP uh, and their likely impact on Afghanistan? Uh, thank you, Dr. Palmer, uh, for this important question. Uh, uh, you, you, you are very right. Uh, the, what I want to say is that the dictatorship governments love uh, each other somehow more. Uh, and one of the things that uh, uh, which, which we were wondering after the U.S. announced the complete withdrawal of, of the U.S. troops from Afghanistan, it was that the China will come to Afghanistan and they will support the government to copy their model and be uh, a dictatorship government like, like them. Uh, and unfortunately, they, this happened to Afghanistan. Uh, the relationship between Taliban and China uh, is, is, is very good. And uh, I would like to say, I would like to add, that uh, one of one of the countries uh, which which giving advices to Taliban is the uh, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, Jinping uh, government, and uh, they are advising the Taliban regime, Taliban government at the moment, and the poverty that we are witnessing at the moment in the country is because of the failed advices or the recommendations of the Chinese government to Taliban. And the things that at the moment we are uh, seeing, we are witnessing in the country. Uh, but uh, one thing that I would, that another thing that I would like to also mention, uh, that uh, the uh, Xi Jinping government, they, they forget that the real people of Afghanistan, as you, you visited Afghanistan, Dr. Palmer, many times, uh, I'm sure that you totally understand this, that the real people of, 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 of the country, they are totally in favor of freedom, in favor of individual rights, and in favor of uh, uh, all uh, kinds of freedom. Uh, and they will face with, with, with a lot of challenges. And, and also, they, they, they forget that uh, because of the work of, or, or, or because of the investment of, uh, like Atlas Network and other organizations who work for more than two decades in the country for promotion of the classical liberal ideas in the country, and local NGOs like, or think tanks like ELSO, uh, there is totally a, a strong resistance uh, 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 f from the side of Afghan people to the Chinese government. Yeah. Thank you. Let, let me turn then, uh, Dan and uh, uh, a Chinese parastatal investment, so state companies in Sri Lanka has been quite a flashpoint uh, as well with regard to the port and then the geopolitical questions about India and Sri Lanka. This is so complicated. Can you take such a complicated thing and lead us through it uh, in a brief time? Yes, Tom. So the problem with the Chinese Communist Party model, the main challenge for our parts of the world, rather than the money or the debt trap, it's like the top-down approach that they set up as a role model for development. 
Now, if I were to give like some numbers, many people think like Sri Lanka in a dead trap to China. But if you look at the numbers, it's not the case. From our foreign debt, about 57% is for financial markets. For China, Exim Bank and for bilateral loans is about 10% from our entire portfolio. But the debt that we have taken from China and where we have invested is a massive burden and it has set up a very flashy expectation that all of these white elephant infrastructure projects can make development of a country. That entire example is wrong and I think that's why, and they are not institutional building any exercises and that has been completely kept aside. Where the engagement of civil society, engage, setting up transparency, accountability, those things haven't been completely left aside. So the challenge is, the more we move forward, so one reason why we have a 50% plus debt for financial markets is we have invested our bilateral loans on white elephant projects and the interest is snowballing. So you have to take loans from the financial markets at commercial rate to finance the interest. And when you have to, when you have to take a loan to finance your interest itself, it's like snowballing, it's not gonna sustain uh, at one point. So that's the problem. So the top-down approach is the issue. Now, if you look at bilateral trade, uh, bilateral loans, our main bilateral uh, uh, debt partner is Japan. But we don't have such issues because it's more long-term, it's, it's transparent, and it's done through proper feasibility studies. But the problem with these top-down, aid-driven uh, development, because it completely forgets about the need of a, uh, of a bottom-up approach where individuals and their liberty, their right for trade, their freedom for trade, their hard working, their freedom for enterprise, that has not been established. So you have like, for, in our case, we have a port which was now again in operation, but which was like, we spent about, about one, one billion US dollars that's a massive amount compared to the size of our economy. We are about a 80 billion GDP country. So when you have like a port which is with, with no ships and we have an airport with no aeroplanes and we have cricket stadiums with no uh, cricket, cricket matches. So when you have like such infrastructure projects, especially with a currency which is, which, is, uh, which is weak because for all these construction cost in imports. So that means we have a that's the, that's the problem that we face at the moment. We have a massive balance of payment crisis because all these construction requires massive amount of steel, cement, everything. So that adds more pressure on the, on the balance of payment. So for me, I think the biggest issue is the wrong model or, uh, or raw, uh, the, the, the wrong flawful outline which has set up with a top-down approach where people like Khalid and me, that, that's where it has to come from. Because when you move from bottom, when people have the freedom, they will do, they will innovate, they will move up on the ladder and that's how you bring everyone together for development and out of poverty. Just because you have a port and a cricket stadium and an and a, and a airport, it doesn't mean it's, it's development. And that's the wrong setup by the CPC, in my view. Can I just jump in as well, Tom? Yeah, I mean, um, listening to the Nana, um, I feel like, you know, that it hits the nail on the head that uh, this model of, of Chinese, you know, investments, CCP investments around the world, um, and in Malaysia, I think what it does is it normalizes a, a development model that, you know, is not uh, transparent, accountable, and inclusive. And I think, uh, with a government uh, like like Malaysia, where you know transparency and accountability um, is almost non-existent to begin with, uh, when you know Chinese investment such as this comes in, it just further normalizes that culture and uh, you know further sort of shuts down any 
uh, attempts by uh, civil society, by uh, the judiciary to sort of investigate these kinds of um, uh, procurement practices. So I think that's the danger, the normalization of, that, of those practices. In effect, it's a reintroduction from Beijing of what used to be the Washington model of foreign aid. We'll build a steel mill for you. We'll do, make these deals for state uh, uh, supported industries, and it failed then. I don't have much hope for it uh, this time around. Uh, Petar had a second part of the question. I'd like to repose that because it's a really important one. There's a, such a variety of governments. Some are federal in their structure across the region, some are unitary national governments. We often think of the national parliament as where the action is or the ministries. Uh, but there's also local government, and there's regional government, and there are states and provinces. And I know I'm just seeing here our partner, Batsant Kari, with the coolest beard at Liberty Forum, without any question. Um, and the work he's doing in Bratnagar and uh, regionally uh, within Nepal to build this up. I know our Indian partners have regional activities. India isn't just a country, it's, it's a world in a way, so much diversity. So let me ask then, why don't we start here with Ira. Do you have also the possibility of regional, local, municipal uh, reforms? Yeah, so this is an interesting question because, um, you know, ideas is, is based in the capital city in Kuala Lumpur, but what we have tried over the years is to, um, you know, get state governments or, no, to get state CSOs, civil society organizations, to be more involved in uh, trying to keep state governments accountable. Because, uh, you know, Malaysia by the theoretically is, is a federation, but it's a very, very centralized uh, federation. So states, um, you know, do not have much autonomy at all in, in most um, areas of governance, um, which means that the, the media spotlight is usually you know, on the federal government, on corruption, on politics at the federal level, but uh, state governments get away with uh, a, lot of, a lot of things um, that, you know, goes completely unnoticed. So what we have tried is to work, uh, is to identify civil society actors in different states in Malaysia and try to, and we were trying to do a, a training program with them uh, on the open budget survey, for example, and how we can use the open budget survey principles um, to, to look at state level budgets and see, um, you know, for example, the budget speech at the state level is not even posted online in most states in Malaysia. So we have no idea what uh, state governments are doing with their budgets. Um, and another thing uh, that we're trying to push for is local council elections. So we have local councils in Malaysia, but they're not elected. So they are polit political appointees and um, people don't know what they actually do, don't know what their role is. So um, trying to push for local council elections, I think it's, it's really important. Um, and it's just, you know, to give citizens more, um, more awareness and, you know, getting citizens empowered on what their um, local councils actually do. So it's a difficult process because, you know, state level sort of civil society activism uh, is not common at all in Malaysia, but um, we are trying uh, through these mechanisms and yeah, just because the state is just so centralized. So it is quite difficult actually, yeah. Uh, let me ask Khaled, I remember when uh, you and I and uh, the team traveled to Balkh province, to mazar -e sharif one of the complaints of the local government was they collect the taxes, 100% goes to Kabul and some of it comes back but there was no federalism in the system so that uh, they were not rewarded in any, any way for having a better tax structure. Uh, and the lack of federalism, some have argued, is one of the reasons for the collapse, the rapid collapse of this centralized Afghan state. What do you think are their prospects in the new situation for more devolution, more localization, more federalism in Afghanistan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Palmer. Uh, th this is really one of the important issues uh, to, to, to we should consider for, for Afghan nation. Uh, ha has you visited many 
provinces, many cities of Afghanistan jointly with us. Well, one of the things that uh, really uh, a number of people, even politicians, academics, and civil society activists, key figures of, of, of the country, policymakers, uh, they wanted since a long time, uh, it was uh, federalism. To, to every state, every province should have their own uh, decision. Uh, and in recent cases, uh, we are also uh, uh, somehow in, 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 in favor of this. To, we should uh, support this idea for Afghan people, and we should work for that. Is there also questions of municipal or local reforms available in Sri Lanka? Uh, yes, Tom, because if you look at the main problem, if you look at the main factors of production, land, labor, uh, all these main factors, entrepreneurship, uh, capital, these all has, these all factors have so many restrictions from the central level. For an example, in Sri Lanka's case, 80% of the land is owned by the government. So they really can't monetize their land. Either you have to take like a license from the central government to cultivate like one type of crop. If it's rice, you can only cultivate rice. If you want to move for corn, you have to go to the government and take another license to cultivate corn. So land is one problem. Same for labor, I think so many regulations for female, uh, and a lot of labor regulations, it's not very conducive. Hiring and firing is not easy. So as a result, that's another problem. And even for capital, it's, the, it's, a, it's very tough. Uh, investing on capital, moving capital out, it's all tough. So as a result, all these four factors have massive problems and we have a red tape from bottom up. And as a result, uh, enterprises are not progressing. And that's the challenge that we all face. And that's the reason, that that's why I insist on building institutions, because that's where the development and coming out of poverty, that's, that's the main reason. Uh, it's not the top-down approach. And I think if we have uh, more freedom for people, then that's what we work on. Um, if we have that freedom, if we, have, if we can bring that, uh, if we can unleash that potential of land, labor, capital, and of course, for entrepreneurship, uh, then the countries like us will flourish in, in, in a quick succession. Because it's small countries, so then it's easy because it's an island, so for a lot of potential for trade. Uh, so that potential is there, and it's like, a, it's like half of the New York state. So you can imagine, like, it's easy to, you know, it's easy to flourish, but we have to unleash those main factors, and that's how I see uh, we have to move forward. Let me uh, pose then a question that I think is relevant to liberal democracy generally, and that is the prevalence of state-owned companies. Because whoever is in charge inevitably uses them to buy patronage and uh, control newspapers with advertising revenue. We see this in Hungary now, we see it in Turkey. So many countries of state-owned enterprises are a political tool besides being economically uh, harmful and loss-making, their political tools. So let me start, uh, I know, uh, Ira, you've been dealing with this issue in Malaysia. Where does that stand? We've got just a little bit of time left. Yes, so state-owned enterprises, um, so little time to, <laughs> to, to talk about this huge topic because, um, so in Malaysia, the uh, state-owned enterprises, we call them government-linked companies in Malaysia, GLCs. So the primary problem with uh, SOEs in Malaysia is that and number f one, the, the, the first thing I think is unclear objectives. So, in a way, there is an identity crisis with SOEs in Malaysia. Why do I say this? It's because, on one hand, um, you know, the government says that you know we we own uh, majority uh, majority of these companies because you know they need to be used for a social objective, and that is true. Uh, in to some extent, there are some uh, SOEs that you know is 
is is used for um, giving scholarships to um, to the Malay population, for example, or you know some of them are used for development and whatnot. But on the other hand, uh, the government also says that uh, you know these companies need to make make a profit, and then need to and you know then these companies also need to undertake investment exercises, whether in Malaysia or in, uh, you know, or overseas. So there is an inherent identity conflict there. You know, do you want these companies to, um, you know, to fulfill a certain social objective for society, or do you want them to make profits and sort of, you know, be efficient and run like a, a private company? So that's number one. And secondly, I, is the, the political uh, issue, which is um, because you know, the, the Malaysia has been ruled by one party for so long, for over 60 years, um, the party and the state is, you know, is so fused and the links are so, um, so close together that the party is almost the state. So that gives a free hand for the party to then use the state-owned enterprises for political objectives. And indeed, you know, political appointees in these companies are prevailing, whether at the federal or at the state level. So... Uh, so these, I would say, are the two main problems with the SOEs in Malaysia. And IDES has actually come up with a website to track political appointees in SOEs. Let me turn that way. Jean-Claude, uh, we have a microphone opportunity. Right, not at the, uh, you can speak loudly, so... We've got a microphone there. The, it has been said sometime there is an issue of compatibility between Islam and democracy, and liberal democracy. And this is true, and we've experienced that with the Arab Spring in the 2014-15, and that hasn't been a success. But at, at the same time, when you talk about Asian values, two of the largest countries in Asia, Indonesia and Malaysia, are dominantly Muslim, and at the same time, practice some form of liberal democracy. So I wonder if you could address that and explain why what has succeeded in Asia has not succeeded in other parts of the world. There's a, that one for you, Ira. That's a <laughs> tough one, too. It is. It is a tough one. So, um, I mean, I think looking at both Indonesia and Malaysia, I mean, Indonesia especially has gone through, you know, a very difficult democratization process. Right, so in 1998, when Suharto fell, um, you know, Indonesia, I think, is on a quite a positive trajectory, I would say, of democratization compared to many other countries in Southeast Asia at the moment, which I think is there is a real backsliding. Um, but I think on the question of liberal democracy and and sort of Islam, you know, Asian values or whatever, I think, um, I mean, Malaysia. I would use Malaysia as an example of. You know, when, when we gained our independence in 1957, our prime minister then, um, you know, we've always had a Malay Muslim prime minister, made actually the conscious choice uh, of a free market economy, which is quite different from Indonesia, where President Sukarno, uh, you know, had very clear um, leftist leanings and, you know, was very sympathetic to the communist cause, even if he at least not um, explicitly was a member of the PKI. So um, I think Malaysia made that conscious choice to choose a, liberal a free market liberal democratic system when we gained our independence um, in 1957. And you know, I, there, there are many reasons to that, but I think the first prime minister then was also British educated. So I think he was inspired by those liberal values that he picked up when he was educated in Oxford, perhaps. Oh, no, it was Cambridge, in Cambridge. So, um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question in the very little time that we have. So we've had the issue then raised about uh, liberal democracy and the importance of it being limited. That's the point of it's being liberal. Democracy doesn't decide everything in life, a small category of collective choices. And Asia has experience with liberal democracy, but also we should remember it's been lost and gained and lost in Europe as well. And so this is a, a universal uh, conflict. Uh, we're down to the last minute, and so I want to just uh, ask all of you to join me in appreciating the bravery, 
the courage of all of our partners uh, who work in difficult situations that are hard for people in uh, Canada or United States or Spain or Norway to appreciate. So uh, let's join in thanking and appreciating and saluting them. Thank you. And for updates, visit atlasnetwork.org, go to our network page and the page about uh, the Center for Asia and Oceania, and I'll see you at lunch. Thank you so much.